So the United States is trying to lead with a large uh, stimulus. And since we have to have a stimulus, it makes sense to, to uh, take this occasion as an opportunity to really uh, start making this big shift. In other words, all three of these crises, economic, national security, and climate, have a common thread running through them. And when you grab hold of that common thread, which is our absurd over-dependence on carbon-based fuels, and pull on it, all three of these crises can begin to unravel. And we hold in our hands the answer, which is this generational one-off investment to switch from an energy infrastructure that's based on expensive, dirty, and vulnerable fuels based on carbon, and shift instead to an infrastructure that's based on fuels that are free from the sun and the wind and geothermal sources, efficiency and science, innovation and ingenuity. I've heard a lot of great comments about Jim's speech last night and his words about how Lincoln had this great grasp of science. And may I say that I join with this organization in welcoming among the many transitions that we've seen in the last two months, the transition to a president who really appreciates and honors science and will give it, is giving it an appropriate role as a basis for policies and decision making. <clears throat> I'm going to show you uh, some pictures. A few of them you've seen before, most of them are new, and this is a much shorter version of what I, of the slideshow I give around the world on a, on a regular basis. But I want to begin with one other prefatory comment. You have noted many anniversaries that coincide with this meeting, and of course yesterday was the 200th anniversary of the birth of both Lincoln and Darwin. Uh, I'll talk briefly about John Tyndall. Uh, but I want to note uh, the 400th anniversary this year of Galileo's first demonstration of the more powerful version of the telescope that had been invented in the Netherlands 401 years ago, the year before he demonstrated in the salons of Milan his new more powerful device that could see the, the moons of Jupiter and could plot the orbits of the planets. And he presented all of his observations in the context of proof for a theory that Copernicus had arrived at uh, six decades before, uh, when Copernicus, uh, in the revolution of, what's the official name, the revolution of the spheres, um, said that there is a, a false perception when people walk out and look up at the sky and the sun appears to move uh, across the sky, it leads to a conclusion that is reinforced by what appears to be common sense, that the sun is going around the earth. And with mathematics, he proved the, the very large uh, difference between the height of the sky and the distance of the Earth from the Sun and pointed out that the Earth moves in at least two uh, uh, different motions, uh, uh, rotating and orbiting. And this insight had not caused the consternation it did for Galileo because his work was published 150 years ago this year. Uh, as really uh, simultaneously at the time he, uh, Copernicus died. But when Galileo offered with his observations the proof of what Copernicus ha had said, it turned out to be, if you'll forgive the phrase, an, an inconvenient truth. <laughs> and he was, of course, imprisoned under house arrest for the remainder of his life and forced to recant. The, the misperception that many have about global warming is very similar in a way to the misperception 
that Copernicus and Galileo uh, had to deal with. For this reason, when we walk out of a building and look up at the sky in bright daylight, it appears to our senses to be a vast and limitless expanse. And that perception leads to an ingrained assumption that surely it is absurd to imagine that we human beings could have any meaningful impact on something as vast as this uh, limitless, seemingly limitless blue sky. With that as a preface, I want to show you some slides, and when they conclude, I'll just give a few brief uh, concluding comments.